coming up on this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society. We're doing our best share impressions and turn them back down. It's dangerous to go alone, so the Nintendo Cartridge Society goes with you. Welcome to Nintendo Cartridge Society. My name is Patrick Ellers, and I am joined, as I am always joined by my co-host, Mark Mitchell. Mark, how you doing? I'm doing great. I uh, really, really, really liked that share impression. I thought it was really good. Um, you don't, you don't, you don't have to. See, you don't have to say these things. Mark. I thought it was great. I genuinely <laughs> thought it was great. Do you, uh, for whatever reason, um, I guess I, I would expect like. Just knowing that song, would you expect that yeah. the music video would be filmed on like a like Navy aircraft carrier? I would not. I, I mean, I, I think I also would not, but it's so etched in my brain. It, you know, growing up in the uh, 80s and early 90s, like that's one of those music videos that's just like etched in your brain. Mm-hmm. Like uh, her on that ship, her wearing that outfit um like it's just it's just so much right <laughs> like i have such a hard time divorcing that little snip of music from that entire music video um i mean i guess uh, objectively the answer is no there's no yeah. way you would predict that um but like just sw- swimming in the ether of uh you know the world and having been alive for almost 40 years like yeah it's always going to be connected yeah, to yeah you it. can't really divorce it i i yeah there's something about music videos where you're, like consistently i expect a music video to be related to the lyrics and i for whatever reason am constantly surprised that that is never the case what about the alanis morissette thank you video i don't uh i don't know that i've seen that one is it does, is she <laughs> a pilgrim I, is she dressed up as a pilgrim <laughs> i think it's the one where she's topless uh and uh is the like everyone is traveling behind her in slow motion and she's like uh like pivoting back and forth, like thanking people for things. Oh, I think uh, it's really literal. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's the exception that proves the rule. Every now and then there is one. Um, Mark, what are we doing here? Um, oh, exceptions that prove the rule. Uh, you could borrow my copy of Sonic Forces, or you could accidentally borrow my copy of Untitled Goose Game. All you gotta do is email us at Nintendo Cartridge Society at, at gmail dot com and give us a mailing address. Uh, and then I send you my copy of this game. You play it for as long as you want. There is a little bit of a spoiler in here in that there might be a goose and not a hedgehog, um, but you just got to roll the dice. Mark, what happens if you don't roll the dice? Uh, you can never win. You can never it, win. Isn't that what Wayne Gretzky's, Gretzky says? You... Yep, Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> famous gambler Wayne Gretzky says, if you don't roll the dice, you can never win. Um, but look, Mark, we have a new thing that you can do by emailing us. And I would argue that this is more... Uh, important, right? Or Fair. more urgent? Yes. Both those things um, probably true. Yes. We are going to be, at the end of this year, we are going to be predicting, uh, I would say, up to 97% accurately, 2021, the year that is coming up next, what Nintendo will do. But we need your help. We need your best Nintendo 2021 predictions. Now, look, I don't know if anyone ever, and no one could have predicted 2020 playing out the way that it did. Uh, so we're going to do our best, our honest best, to try and predict, uh, pr- predict 2021. Email us your predictions, uh, and we will uh, talk about them on the show. Again, it's Nintendo Cartridge Society at, at gmail.com. gmail.com. Um, and sky's the limits on these, right? Like, whatever you think is going to happen, whatever you think might be fun to happen, uh, during the year, um, let us know. We need those before Friday, December 18th. Mark, that's a quicker turnaround than usual. That is. Normally, we like to give like six, eight weeks, let people luxuriate in it, really think about it, collect their thoughts, and then send it in. This time, I'm not saying it's slapdash, but I'm just saying everybody's no, got to every, every, everybody's got to move a little bit faster, including us. Yeah. It's the holidays, okay? Look, this is the holiday rush. We all got to be on top of it. We got to be on our A game. 
that means you. All right, Mark, we have got some fun stuff to get into today. So let's get into our topic of the week. And the topic this week is Nintendo time travel. Uh, This is, of course, inspired by the uh, premise for Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity, um, which... Uh, I mean, this, first of all, we, this, it's a prequel, right? To Breath of the Wild. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. But it also starts with a weird little time travel conceit uh, that there is like this little egg guardian, the little guardian that, you know, fights with Link and Zelda and everything at the sort of end of the calamity, traveling back in time to the beginning of the calamity to change things, to make sure they go the way they did the first time. Uh, it's is is there a split timeline here? <laughs> what is he going back to? Is it Terminator rules where he always went back? I don't know. I I feel like I'm not far enough in Age of Calamity to know. But but this got me thinking that like Zelda is probably the only Nintendo franchise that I can think of that regularly deals with time travel or has regularly dealt with time travel, and really has only like dealt with time travel because of ocarina of time right right uh, all, all the rest of the well and i guess um uh majora's mask is is time traveling in that you're uh playing those same uh three days over and over again but for whatever reason a groundhog's day scenario doesn't feel like <laughs> time travel to me although i, th- I guess technically it is. is yeah yeah <laughs> well in any event um do you think that creates multiple so if the, if <laughs> ocarina of time creates three separate timelines um, from its uh, various paths and, and time travel whatevers. Um, even though I still don't really understand why there's a, a scenario where the hero just fails, where you get a game over. <laughs> <laughs> In which case, every shouldn't every game have uh, a splitting paths that way? In any event, um, that uh, it creates two separate timelines because of your time travel nonsense. Does that mean that Majora's Mask creates like an infinite number of timelines. I, I think probably, which maybe solves one of the uh, concerns you've had playing the game in the past, where it's just so sad that your work gets like undone every seventy-two hours. Like all the good things that you've made happen um, in your in those three days gets reset when the clock gets reset. But maybe that's not true. Maybe that timeline just continues on, and you're starting on uh, a new path. The timeline continues on, but it also the town gets hit by a moon oh yeah so, like, <laughs> <laughs> that's a great point that's a really good point that's why you have to hop back in time so it's a it, look it's a sad stressful story no matter how you slice it um but so we thought wouldn't it be fun to uh go into other nintendo games um and maybe even some zelda games i don't know i don't I'm, i have not previewed mark li- mark's list and he's not previewed mine um and we are going to discuss some time travel scenarios where we want to take characters from one point in their game timeline and transport them to another point in the same timeline. Um, We have not really been more uh, specific or guided in our instructions to each other than this. So I expect we may have some surprises for each other or we may zig uh, when you expect to see a zag. Um, But so I've got a couple, Mark's got a couple, uh, and I think we'll just kick it off with um i i will start uh, please and I'll, I'll i'll start with sort of my my broadest idea okay um and that is that is within the world of splatoon now S- splatoon <laughs> have we picked all the same ones again Mark? Uh, I, saw, I also I have, smile i also have a splatoon pitch i'm very excited to hear your so my splatoon pitch uh is that it would you know uh, you would be out with your squad of, you know, three other Inklings, uh, inking up the joint, having a great time in Turf War, uh, and then being pulled backwards in time um, by the army that is fighting the original Turf War. Yes. One of the things, is this, is this your pitch as well? <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that uh, they sort of gloss over in Splatoon, like there, there is a, uh, a sort of like, you know, downfall of, of man and like they're existing in a world that seems to be post-human. Um, but one of the things that you're doing in Splatoon, uh, these uh, four-on-four matches, is called Turf War. And it's like they're doing it as a tribute to the original, actual violent uh, Turf War. Um, and so I want to see some, you know, someone who's developed time travel technology from way back in the past who 
it travels to the future, which is like Splatoon's present, uh, to gather warriors to fight in Turf War. And all these people are like, yeah, we know Turf War. We can do it. That's no problem. <laughs> and then getting getting there and it not being like a fun thing where you're like inking up the place. Um, but where you are like legitimately fighting for every <laughs> scrap, <laughs> like th- this is you know uh, one one of those um, one of those scenarios where like uh, the the characters would go in like super confident and then like legitimately get murdered. <laughs> um, I I I would just be very excited to first of all I I like Splatoon I like the way the game mm-hmm. plays but I I always want to see first of all something a little bit more like campaign driven. But also something with a little more weight behind it. That, that's part of why I liked the um, Octo expansion in Splatoon Two. Um, was that there was like this sort of like covert, um, like you know, your Agent Seven, Agent something, Agent Eight. I can't remember. Um, uh, that like there was some like an intrigue happening there. Um, but if it was just like an all-out war, um, that that would be a cool story to follow. Yeah, totally. So. Uh, that's so funny because I also had this idea. Do you know what it made me think of was um, right after Call of Duty Modern Warfare came out, you know, like 20 years ago or whatever it is at this point, yeah. like 15 years ago, um, the next title in the Call of Duty franchise was World at War that went back to like World War II. And so like the weapons were a lot, you know, like they weren't as advanced, like all that kind of stuff. And that's exactly what I was thinking about for this like prehistoric Amazing. Splatoon. And so I, I went uh, to, like, the Splatoon wiki and read some of, like, the history of Splatoon. So basically, you're uh, exactly right. Where, like, 12... Splatoon takes place in a world that's basically, like, 12,000 years after Judd gets put into a capsule. So, that, so the cat is kind of like Fry from Futurama, gets put into sure. this capsule. 12,000 years elapse. I was, that's that's an insane amount of time. <laughs> Fry was frozen for one thousand years, and like society crumbles like three times while he's in that tube. <laughs> Judd is frozen for twelve thousand years. Twelve thousand years, and when he is wow. removed from the tube, he is like adjudicating the first, uh, <laughs> uh, what did we just call it? Oh yeah, turf war. Yeah, and that is what I want to see. I would love to see, like you're saying, like, uh. The game would play like very similar to Splat- to Splatoon and Splatoon Two, but the weapons would be totally different because we're dealing with like ancient weapons at this point, not like the modern ones that Sheldon has. Oh, that's interesting. That's uh, but but would it still be? Uh, is there a way to combine these ideas? Because I, I like the idea that the the weaponry would be, um, you know, way more uh, sort of um, primitive. Primitive. Um, but would it also be like a little bit more violent too? That like they're actually trying to uh, murder each other and not just paint more turf. Right. Yeah. Because they are like fighting over something that has weight, and then later it just got turned into sport. Um, that's something you just do for fun. But yes, I think that is definitely the case. But I think you also like it has to be like weight with really. I, I think there's a reason like we've never like seen this because the idea that yeah these two like races it's horrifying yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like how you balance that with like the fun of Splatoon I like hopefully there's ancient idols right uh, like pop yeah. idols yeah that's a that's an interesting point I, I wonder if they're like if the ancient idols are like gods or something mm-hmm. <laughs> um yeah okay that's that that's cool I I, I like that a lot. All right, so um, this would be a good fun game. This, uh, okay, so I'm gonna do probably my most grounded, I guess, pitch, and this is okay. one involving Star Fox. And basically, I want to tell a game from James McCloud's perspective that is basically the movie Interstellar, but J- but for James Whoa! McCloud. Because look, look, and. Oh! <laughs> spoilers for Mark, a b- Mark, 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 Mark. Spoilers for a bunch of Star Fox games, but at the end of Star and Fox and for Interstellar and for Interstellar, that's right. Uh, so at the end of Star Fox sixty four, uh, Fox like, I uh, like destroys Andross's lab, and Fox is like escaping. Um, James, ghost apparition, whatever appears and guides Fox like out of the lab before it's destroyed and before Fox dies. 
and then James like flies away when he's out of the base. And Fox is surprised to see his father is alive, but is his father alive? It like is he a ghost? What's going on? I'll tell you what's going on. I love it. I is, love this so much. <laughs> is that the backstory for James McLeod's disappearance or his death is that uh, he was like orig- he was on the original Star Fox team and he responded to like uh, the threat by Andros for the first time and then Andros cooks it up with help by uh, what's the name of Pigma for um like it everything to go awry and Star Fox fall or James McCloud falls into a black hole. And so my pitch is that the game is following James Cloud James McCloud after he falls into the black hole. He ends up in yes. some like sort of like Tesseract sort of thing, like uh Matthew McConaughey in Interstellar, where he can where like time is just like a really loose concept and he's able to see all the threads at once. And so he's able to like affect change mildly in the real world, which would then explain why Fox sees uh, James McCloud at the end of Star, uh, Star Fox 64. And at the end of Star Fox Zero, and maybe also at the end of the original Star Fox, if you're playing uh, the, like, the right path. Um, they, it, it, the Star Fox 64 story is one that they revisit over and over again in those games. Um, so that could also even be like a little bit of an explanation for that is that like we're seeing different iterations of like James mm-hmm. reach, trying mm-hmm. to reach out to his son and like landing in the same moment in time. Um, that's super cool. And I think also Star Fox has such a good um, like it's got all those really trippy levels where you're like in nebulas and like stuff is just like melting away and it's totally surreal. Um, and you could make a whole game out of that, um, which would just be James McCloud. Uh, yeah, piloting his way through this black in, hole. in like the that's event so horizon. Cool. <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, okay, Mark. Speaking of event horizon, I'm gonna go with this as my second, uh, my my second pitch. Um, Luigi's Mansion. Great series. Luigi hunting ghosts. Uh, you can move him into progressively larger. First, it's a mansion. Then it's several mansions. Then it's a, a hotel with many, uh, many stories. What do you do when you've maxed out the premise of anything? Mark, what do you do? Where do you go after you've done the biggest you can do uh, on, on the ground? You go into space. So <laughs> Luigi and Professor Egad develop a time machine because King Boo has fled to the future. Mm-hmm. And they need to travel to the future to stop him from haunting a ghost ship. Um, so they got to go into space. It becomes Luigi's Mansion cross Dead Space cross Event Horizon, <laughs> um, and is just a spooky ghost story, uh, told on a spaceship. Also, there's a little bit of alien in there, <laughs> a little bit of sunshine. It would be great. That would be. That's like the perf. I mean, uh, the idea that Luigi would have to go up against something that is like not. I mean, I guess it could be a ghost, but yeah, if you get if you put like alien spin on there, like going up against like xenomorphs, so he's on like an abandoned space station, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, but it li- like uh, have have you seen Event Horizon? It's got Sam Neill in it. I think I saw it once. Um, so it, it's it is a like legitimately haunted, um, spaceship. Oh, right? got like, it, it's, got it's it. Got, it's got like a borderline shining thing, uh, g- going on there, like. There is a point where the doors open and like blood rushes out. Um, so like, uh, I, I that's that's really what I want to go for. I still want it to be ghosty, right? Like, and if we need to have like uh, aliens and like ghosts of aliens, that's fine. <laughs> but like, uh, it's got to be King Boo finds his way into the future and into space. Um, this is this is my one. Uh, time travel into the future mm, mm-hmm. um, that I just I just got to get Luigi and Professor Egad and also like they're a good buddy dynamic no matter what just like with regular ghost busting but if Professor Egad has to provide Luigi with the various means that he can like uh, you know get like some magnetic boots so he can like walk around outside on like the the hull of the ship mm-hmm. or um, you know something to make the gravity work um, like I, I it, it feels like it makes him an even more crucial piece of the luigi's mansion uh sort of infrastructure yeah and you're absolutely right like including aliens and especially like ghosts of aliens would 100 percent just be a hat on a hat 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> what is the name of the what is the name of the dog? Like Polterpup? Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Hopefully Polterpup is also along for the ride. I would love to see Polterpup in like a spacesuit. Uh, that sounds oh adorable to me. That's so good. Uh, and maybe there's some way to even uh, tie in Leica, the Russian space dog. <laughs> like maybe there's there's some there's some kind of connection you can make there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a romance. <laughs> that dog is long dead now. So yeah. <laughs> His ghost would be up, her ghost would be up in, uh, in the stratosphere. Yeah, that makes sense. So uh, I feel like, uh, for whatever reason, a lot of our pitches have, like, a darker bent to them. And I don't know why, uh, like, time travel is doing that to us. But here, because this one, I think, is kind of in the same path. So here's my pitch. Basically, take, um, like, uh, Zira and Cornelius gets go back in time in Escape from the Planet of the Apes. Um, yes. And they come back, go to back to like modern in quotes, like in the 70s, you know, like uh, modern era. I would love to, t- what I would love to do is take the Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong of the Donkey Kong oh. Country era yes. and take them back in time to the like arcade Donkey Kong era when the relationship between man and Kong was clearly very different. Adversarial, yes. Where like okay, that, they they would have to they'd have to confront planet their, of the Kongs planet of the Kongs they would have to kind of like confront the fact that they like descend from a line of villains presumably mm-hmm. even though they themselves are the heroes of their own story yeah no that's good they uh, these are dark and, and there's a <laughs> lot of like dark introspection that has to uh, go on there but that's yeah that's is there what sends them back in time because like. In the Planet of the Apes, um, they're catapulted back in time by the power of a nuclear blast that destroys the planet, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, is, I believe that is true. Is, <laughs> is it? And because the end of look, if you haven't spoilers for everything, I guess. <laughs> um, the second Planet of the Apes movie from like 1969 or well, maybe 70, um, beneath the Planet of the Apes, uh, features a um, like society of human beings under the ground. Who are worshiping an unexploded nuclear weapon and they're like they're mutants and they have telepathy and it is the weirdest um and it, totally worth check even though like i think all all four of the original um plan the ape sequels are like pretty boring um they, that second one is at the very least wild conceptually yeah and ends ends with the bomb exploding and the planet <laughs> Going yeah. away with no promise of like more to come. Yeah, the ultimate bummer, and really like Charlton Heston pulling a uh, uh, Harrison Ford like Han Solo situation where he's just like, I just want to be dead. So how do we yeah, make that happen? Right. How do we make sure that I don't have to come back for any more movies? And he's barely in that second one. Too. <laughs> he basically shows okay. up at the end to blow up. Yeah, that's right. Um, so it. What is is it something like that in this uh, Planet of the Kongs? Or? So I'm gonna I uh, because this is so dark. I'm going to say that it that the Kongs go back for a not so dire reason. I actually think it's mm. going to be more like uh, Donkey Kong's like long headedness that sends them back because I think it's all a trap by King K. Rule. So he's like I totally. think he yeah. basically like devised this um, time machine to get rid of the Kongs. So he like doesn't matter where I take them. Um, they always make their way back. So I'm going to send them back in time. And, and uh, the way he does that is he like just like uh, lays a trail of bananas because Donkey yeah, Kong cannot it. resist um, t- into the time machine. And then when Donkey Kong like goes in there expecting more bananas, there's probably a sign with an arrow t- oh, pointing to the open door that says more bananas. More bananas. Uh-huh. Right. And then and so- more is probably spelled wrong. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. And then uh, like M-U-R probably. Um. Yeah, I was gonna say M O A R, but yeah. Oh yeah, either one I think works Both depending good. on Both how good. much <laughs> space they have on the sign, um, and their dexterity. So he uh goes into the time machine. You know, the cr- uh, Kremlins like close the door, send him back to the Donkey Kong era because he knows or he thinks anyways that like Mario or Jumpman is going to take care of Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong when they arrive. Yeah, no, that's smart. Um, it, I I am picturing that the time machine looks like the uh, go with me on this journey. Um, the time machine is uh from Banjo Kazooie, the Gruntilda's machine that takes um Tui's beauty from her. 
I that's what the machine looks like to me. I think that only makes sense. Uh, very good. Uh, and and so how 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 does this turn out for um does does Donkey Kong have to like physically fight the original Donkey Kong, aka <laughs> Cranky Kong, or is it more of like a does Donkey Kong model good behavior for him? Like what what happens in this game? Yeah, so I I think that it's kind of like a new Donk City situation where you know like Donkey Kong um is used to the, his tropical island but instead is brought to this like very urban environment and people are like yeah, totally. oh no it's it's a kong right ah but then donkey kong it's a game like you were saying of modeling good behavior it is of course a platformer but he but like he is showing you know like he's finishing yeah. jobs for people he's uh you know citizens are like hey i need this to happen and he's like you need your baby down from that tree got it i will absolutely do that um, and it is uh, it is just Donkey and Diddy that go back in time. I think so because you need something for a sequel. But yeah, it's a it's a genre that I think we can fairly call a morality platformer. Yes, um, and I think the sequel would be Donkey Kong Junior gets sent to the present. Yes, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh huh. Did we have we uh, when we were talking about the Kongs before? I know that we've had this discussion previously, but have. We let's have it again. Yeah, let's keep doing it. Okay, I love so it. so um, Cranky Kong is Donkey Kong from like yes. the original arcade games. Donkey Kong Junior then is presumably the Donkey Kong from Donkey Kong Country's father, but we never see Donkey Kong Junior. Well, we Donkey Kong Junior is present in a couple of different places. Uh, he is obviously in the original Donkey Kong Junior. He's in the original uh, Mario Kart. Sorry, um, but but I mean, uh, he, he is not in like the Donkey Kong Country universe, right. as far as we're aware. Okay, that's right. right. He, Great. He's he's like the missing generation. That's yeah. Right. Okay, just wanted to make sure I had that straight. Um, so he could even when he finds himself in the present, could realize that his legacy has all but been forgotten. That like everyone still knows the original Donkey Kong, uh, and they know like his grandson, but no one knows him. So he can like go out and like try to solve the mystery of what happened to him. But oh, the mystery yeah. is that he was catapulted forward through time <laughs> and simply ceased to exist in his original time. Oh, that actually, wow, we solved a lot of problems with the uh, Donkey we Kong did. chronology. We, did. we solved a problem with time travel. We solved a narrative problem with time travel. That never happens. You only create them. Um, speaking of creating uh, narrative problems with time travel, it's time to talk Metroid. Um, Samus Aran, I want her to go back and look, Sa- here are the things we know about Samus's past. It's not a lot. And a lot of the information, uh, like about her life prior to her service in the Federation army, um, is, uh, relegated to the stuff of like the manga, um, and, uh, you know, instruction booklets and stuff. Um, she is, uh, orphaned at an early age, um, when space pirates, um, destroy the, uh, space station that she and her family are, are living on. She befriends um, some elderly members of the Chozo race, um, the last sort of of their, because, you know, the the Chozos at at the time that you're playing uh, Metroid are all but extinct um, and have basically uh, gifted Samus with their technology and their blood, according to some accounts. Um, So, like, she is the product of, uh, you know, the sort of, she is the inheritor of the Chozo legacy, but she never gets to interact with them when they are in their prime until... This game, and I don't have a method for send, sending her back in time, but it's space, so maybe it's a black hole. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> um, but I want her to go back to like the peak of Chozo's uh, civilization when they are colonizing planets like SR388, like Zebes, like Talon 4, um, and uh, see what makes them tick. Um, and there's also there, there's an inflection point in Chozo history where they go from being great warriors to being uh, a more peaceful society. Um, and I, uh, I was doing a little research on this and I found um, an interview from uh, the Metroid database that they conducted with uh, producer uh, Yoshio Sakimoto. Um, and so the, the, the question is, um, uh, I have a question regarding the design materials in the development room uh, blah, 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 in the manga. Um, the Chozo are described as uh, a peaceful race but in these documents, why are they only shown as a warrior race everywhere? And Sakamoto responds, Formerly, the Chozo had advanced technology and were a race proud of their advanced fighting strength. However, due to their long lives, their fertility decreased and their civilization declined. 
so they changed their personality to a non-violent race. The Chozo gave Samus the power suit, uh, which was created by assembling together the essence of this advanced technology. It sounds to me like something happened to them, right? They had something that decreased their fertility. I'm seeing a real, like, sp- uh, uh, children of men scenario here where um, uh, they uh, either it just like vanishes that people just, just stop having babies and like violence breaks out like internally um, and like I need Samus to be there for uh, children of Chozo uh, is like she needs to be in the thick of it <laughs> and like just getting down and dirty with it yeah, I had a. Uh, I I like this again. I think we're going real dark with a lot of these time travel ones. <laughs> it's hard not to. It's hard not to. Go. Why Why else do you go to the past if not to fix something? Right. right? Yeah. Exactly. I actually had a pitch for uh, Metroid time travel that is also sending Samus back, and I think uh, for me it was to have her prevent the creation of Metroids. So that's interesting. Like, so that that's like in. Sure, she can still be, depending on where you set it in the timeline, she can still be conflicted because she has, like, some sort of connection to the Metroids. But um, uh, thanks to the events of Super Metroid and Metroid Other M. But yeah, I think, like, uh, at some point she gets sent back because they're like, look, the Metroid menace is out of control. The only way we're ever ever able to, like, Go really back, to get a handle of this yeah. is if we, like, stop it yeah, at the beginning. And so M- Samus gets sent back. Yeah, and I toyed with that idea too, but for she's gone so far in the direction of like protecting the Metroid and protecting like other alien life. Mm-hmm. Um that like I don't know, for for me like and th- maybe this is just like the the direction that I like for Samus and if we ever get another Metroid game um that takes place after Metroid Fusion, and I don't know that we ever will, right? <laughs> but if we ever do, uh, I want to see it sort of like continued along that line where she is not uh, uh, allied with man so much as she is like an adversary uh, to to mankind and sort of like an ally of the of the aliens, including the Metroid. Mm. Um, but but yours uh, yours makes sense. Uh, yours makes probably more sense. Um, but you know, time travel we can split things, man. <laughs> like you know, there can be one version of her that travels back to stop the Metroid, another version that goes to like keep the metroid going and they could have to fight each other yeah absolutely and don't forget that there's also there can also be a metroid timeline where she fails zelda <laughs> yes. zelda has like blazed that path for us 100 percent. um mark would you like me to go again then yeah go for it okay um so this is this is my final uh I- I- idea uh i am going back to zelda now um uh i'm going to the world of the wind waker uh, and this is going to be a game featuring everyone's favorite steamboat captain, Linnebeck, mm-hmm. from the Phantom Hourglass, uh, who is a skilled uh, boatsman, um, but sort of a klutz and clumsy at everything else he does. So he gets his hands on a time machine. Who cares how? Um, and is like, you know what? Uh, we Link and I had some fun adventures with uh, Ghost Zelda. I'd like to go back in time and actually meet Zelda when, when she was alive. Um, so he punches some numbers into the time machine, but he's too dumb and clumsy to do it right. So he gets sent back all the way to uh, before the Great Flood, right? This is uh, as Ganon and his dark forces are descending on Hyrule Castle. Um, and the king and everyone is like, we don't know what to do. Um, we can't fight these guys off forever. And so they pray to the gods of Hyrule to you know, take the wheel, basically. This is what happens in, in, the, in the backstory to Wind Waker, by the way, that they're just like, I don't know, please do something, gods of Hyrule. And the gods are like, yo, we got you. And they send down a flood to wipe out. And, you know, they, they say uh, all of your people, you know, make for the mountaintops. Um, we're going to flood the land. Um, and so this is where Lindebeck finds himself. Um, and so he is tasked because he knows the, he knows it is the Great Sea, but it is also just Hyrule. So he knows like the layout of it. Um, he's tasked with getting people to the highest mountaintops while the king of Hyrule stays at the castle and like keeps Ganon's forces coming at him. And, you know, this flood doesn't happen all at once, right? Like uh, a kingdom doesn't flood in one day. Um, so right. like the traversal gets difficult as like the waters get deep, but you got to make sure to like lead people up to the mountaintops. Um, and uh, get them to safety so that they can colonize what will be the islands 
uh, in the Great Sea of Hyrule. This is great. I mean, I feel like another thing with these time travel stories is like we know how they end and we know that a lot of times they don't end happy. And so finding that like balance, like Lindbeck's a great character for something like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I, I feel like Lindbeck for me uh, just doesn't get enough play, right? Like he is totally. a, a faithful sidekick in uh, Phantom Hourglass and then just totally discarded. Like no one ever talks about him anymore. It's a shame. He's a great character. He is the Han Solo of the <laughs> Zelda games and he only appears in one of them. Yeah. It's a shame, Mark. It's a shame. That would be really fun. Um, okay, so uh, I have two like mini pitches uh, okay. that I want to make um, to close out here. So one, I'm just gonna. It's just a phrase, and it's prehistoric Pokemon. I would love Ooh. an excuse <laughs> to go back to like the Flintstone yes. times of the Pokemon mm-hmm. universe, where you got like sand shrews with um, big tusks, you know. Uh, like right. stuff like that. Like I would love to see the prehistoric variations of all of these Pokemon. Um. So l- let me ask you this. Uh, and it is probably just our perception as people viewing the world of Pokemon through games and anime and whatever. Um. But are there more Pokemon with the passage of time? Like when, in the early days of Pokemon, were there only 151 Pokemon, or is that just what we were able to see? In the early days of Pokemon. Oh, interesting. Do you understand my question? I, I do understand your question. I think that we're only seeing like a glimpse of Pokemon. Just got like it, how, because since we're going region to region, like yeah. each region has their own Pokemon. And sometimes they cross over, but other times they don't. Okay. And there are some like fossil y kind of uh, Pokemon, right? That um, look like uh, the sort of like. Um, I guess just like fossils that that you would, <laughs> that you would find, right? I there, think there are fossils. I, I think there are. I think there are. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, how they fit into this, I don't really know. Maybe there's even more fossilized versions of them. Uh, yeah, no, this this is great though, and you could. Uh, it would be easy to do this in like a uh, Land of the Lost um style uh sort of scenario where it's just. A Pokemon trainer is out with his Pokemon and he falls down a hole <laughs> and, and finds himself in a prehistoric land. Uh, I mean, that's already more complicated than a lot of Pokemon stories. So, yeah, like, I think that's great. Narratively rich. Man, land of the Lost is a ridiculous concept. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, and so my, and then my second one it revolves around Punch Out. And I think one of the reasons why we haven't oh. seen punch like a uh, new punch out games is that it's become a little less okay to make like incredibly caricatured versions of like uh fighters based purely on like where they come from and so their like uh nationality or like their race. And so one I way mean, to don't g- tell that to the Street Fighter team. <laughs> <laughs> One way to get around that would be to have punch out through time. So basically little Mac gets caught in like the uh, fighting like wormhole. Yes. And so instead of making fun of uh, people based on their origin, we're making fun of people based on the time in which they existed. So you've got yes. like steampunk guy. You've got uh, like caveman <laughs> you know, from guy. Steampunk time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, this is good. Mark, did you ever play the game um, Eternal Champions? This is a, a Genesis game. No. It's atrocious. It is oh. a, a, a Street Fighter-like game. Um, and the, the, the premise is that all of these warriors, all of these great warriors from throughout history and the future um, have died, um, and they battle each other in heaven or hell or whatever the Probably hell. is. Probably hell. Probably hell. Um, in order to do something, <laughs> I don't. I don't really know what what the reward is for uh, fighting forever. But um, I, I like the idea that it is like the best warriors from throughout history that have lived their lives um, and then have to battle each other in the afterlife. Um, that could be a cool premise, and is like sort of time travel. Um, that like Little Mac is just like the hero from you know nineteen eighty eight or whatever whenever punch out came out i think you just want to make all these dark and it's important to you that the premise starts with little mac is dead 
<laughs> yes, to begin with. Okay, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Uh, so it's it's just it's just Little Mac finds a time machine or uh, what? what? <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess it doesn't need it doesn't need I, more explanation than he boxes people from throughout. Yeah, time. somebody comes from the future and is like, "Hey, we need your help." Uh, defeating all these people from the past because or and future if you help us mm-hmm. beat people up through time a good thing will happen or a bad thing will be stopped from happening and uh so off little mac goes um this is great i love it uh do you know what i love most about it no but i'm hoping you'll tell me i of course i will uh it's that one of the characters has to be harry the main character from Telero Boxer. <laughs> that from the future, the robotic boxer. This is how we bring Telero Boxer to uh to modern consoles. This Perfect. Is how it happens. Yes. Yes. Uh Mark, these are all really good time travel ideas. I'm sorry I tried to make every one of them dark. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's just uh where I am right now. If uh if you have any great uh time travel Nintendo game ideas please email them to us at nintendo cartridge society at, at gmail.com. gmail.com um all right mark let's close this out all right that's gonna do it for this episode of nintendo cartridge society remember please rate review and subscribe on apple Podcasts if you like the episode you can share it on facebook or twitter or wherever you share stuff we appreciate it when you do on twitter i am at patrick underscore ellers Mark is at MKE Mitchell, and the show is at Named Cart Society. We also have a Facebook page, which is just Nintendo Cartridge Society. Olivia Duncan made our logo. Our theme music is provided by Ape Betty. You can get more of his music by going to apebetty.com or by listening right now. For my co host, Mark Mitchell, this is Patrick Ellers guaranteeing you that I will make it dark and bring up Teller Boxer every time. Thank you for listening. what an NPE is? Yeah, that's okay. No one does. It's a non-paternal event, and it's what they call it when you do a DNA test and find out that you actually are the milkman's son, or your parents used a sperm donor, or you were adopted and no one ever told you. I'm Eve Sturgis, host of Everything's Relative, where I invite my guests to talk about DNA discoveries and how spitting into a tube has changed their lives for better or worse. Episodes are out every other Friday. Find them on Campfire Media or subscribe wherever you find your podcasts. Campfire.